Welcome to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have you here for this special episode. We are in Oxford in the United Kingdom in the Lamb and Flag, which is a pub that was frequented by the Inklings. And uh, we're really uh, quite pleased that the people who run this place uh, saw fit to let people off the street, just like us, just kind of wander in and take over a room in the back and do what we're doing. Uh, but I uh, am C.R. Wiley, I'm a pastor. I serve a church in the Pacific Northwest. I taught philosophy for about a decade at the college level. I was the uh, vice president of the Academy of Philosophy and Lever Letters in the United States, and I am a senior editor of Touchstone Magazine. All right, Glenn. I'm Glenn Sunshine. I am a retired history professor specializing in the Reformation. I am a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. I work for Reflections Ministries. I have my own 501c3. That's a nonprofit organization called Every Square Inch Ministries. I write, I teach, freelance, I do a bunch of things. All right, Tom. I'm Tom Price. I teach systematic theology. I teach theological ethics and apologetics. Uh, one of the places, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. And this is kind of like a homecoming for you. This is a homecoming for me. And al although uh, our wonderful guest uh, wouldn't probably remember me, I do remember him. I was a, a bit younger, had a little more hair, and I was a student here. And uh, I, I can remember the very topic. It was on critical realism. But anyway, we can get into that a little bit later. And it was many years ago. But anyway, we're honored to have Professor uh, Alistair McGrath with us. Um, uh, theologian, apologist, uh, writes widely and richly, especially in the field of uh, science and religion, uh, the Reformation, and apologetics, but I'll let him introduce himself. <laughs> so anything That's that just Tom a missed. Warm -up. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks. Well, um, well I, I'm Alistair. Uh, uh, like C.S. Lewis, I was born in Belfast. Like C.S. Lewis, I began as an atheist and discovered Christianity here in Oxford. I've just retired from my Oxford professorship, which was in science and religion, but I still hang around here because it's such a great place to be, and you meet such interesting people. Right. Well, as, as Tom noted, and, and we all feel we're really honored to have you with us today. And a couple of things that I think uh, we can start with. Um, obviously, you've written about C.S. Lewis. You mentioned him just a moment ago. You've also written about apologetics. Uh, there's a book you wrote entitled Mere Apologetics. Um, there are themes that you have uh, developed and written about that we like to talk about a lot on the show. But maybe uh, a good place to start uh, is some, uh, some of your uh, writing on C.S. Lewis, I think, has uh, prompted some things in my own mind that I think might be uh, worth delving into a little bit. So one of the things that, um, that I remember you brought out when you were addressing the subject of C.S. Lewis is that uh, Owen Barfield said there were three different Lewises. <laughs> and I don't know if you remember that. I write things that I wrote a long time ago. I don't remember saying <laughs> this or things. But uh, it looks like you remember. Can you, can you describe for us what Owen Barfield meant when he said there are three these three different Lewises? Well, there, there are at least three different Lewises. I mean, there is Lewis, the intellectual historian. There is Lewis, who is the scholar of English literature. There is Lewis, who is also a remarkably good writer of stories, and not all scholars of literature can write as right. well as... Um, we know that. Well as, uh, yes. <laughs> but of course, Lewis is also a Christian apologist, and all of these things are just interconnected and interwoven in Lewis. So in effect, if you come in by one door, you're going to find all the others as well. Right, right. I know in my case, uh, I came to Lewis through Tolkien. You know, I, I read Tolkien as a teenager, came to uh, see that he had some friends that he uh, hung out with, uh, pe people that were known as Inklings, and then that's how I came to C.S. Lewis. Actually, I didn't start with the Chronicles of Narnia. I started with, I think, probably Mere Christianity is where I began. Now, one of the things that you bring out in your, uh, your writing on Lewis is that, uh, and this is probably news to people, uh, because I think, particularly in America, because most Americans, they think of Oxford as this sort of, sort of like uh, Emerald City on the other side of the ocean where everything is nice and everybody <laughs> appreciates each other and it's just love all the time, <laughs> that uh, Lewis was as loved and appreciated in the Oxford community as he is among many people who are his fans in the United States. But he actually wasn't. He was, there were people who were not entirely all that pleased with 
C.S. Lewis. Can you maybe uh, elaborate a little bit on that? Well, I think Lewis found himself in difficulty in Oxford. I mean, I think the problems really began in the 1940s because what happened was, of course, Lewis was employed as a scholar. His job was to do research, to write academic works and to teach. And what happened was Lewis began to emerge as a very significant popular writer. And uh, Lewis's academic colleagues, I think, began to feel that perhaps Lewis, the, the popular writer, had rather displaced the academic writer. Because if you look at Lewis's publication record, we have the Allegory of Love, we have a rather short preface to Paradise Lost, and then we have Radio Silence for quite a long time before that massive book on the Oxford history of English literature appears, which in effect completely re-established him and helped got his chair at Cambridge. So in many ways, the problems were, first of all, there were many who thought that Lewis in effect, had become a popular writer rather than a scholar. Secondly, Lewis was quite aggressive in his, in his, in his Christianity, whereas yeah. Tolkien was not. Tolkien was very, very subtle. Right. And I think many people find themselves rubbed up the wrong way by that. And that's why I think it's very, very helpful to compare Lewis's Oxford period with this Cambridge period, because when he goes to Cambridge, he leaves all of this behind. He's able to start all over again. And that's when some of the best works come out, like, you know, The Four Loves, yeah. or, you know, you think of some of the books there, like Reflections on the Psalms, or, or indeed, uh, Till We Have Faces. So I think, you know, Lewis is going through various phases, but I think that Lewis did find Oxford eventually very suffocating, and really needed to go somewhere else where he could recharge his batteries and start off all over again. Right. Was there also maybe the uh, dynamic that the, the Lord experienced when he went home to Nazareth? Uh, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives? I think that's right. I think that um, uh, doc, uh, in Belfast next year, there's going to be a big conference with C.S. Lewis. Hmm. It's called Homecoming. And, and really part of the agenda is Northern Ireland saying, you really were one of us. Yeah. <laughs> even, though, even though, you know, most people in Ireland tend to think of Lewis as being English. When I was growing up in Northern Ireland, you know, people talked about C.S. Lewis as an English author. He's not one of us. And so I think there's, there's this need to kind of reconnect. And certainly Lewis has reconnected with Oxford in a very big way. Look at the literary output of Oxford University Press. <laughs> right. Lewis right. features very prominently. Right. And, but, uh, but Cambridge also has a very big a claim on Lewis, I think. But the point is simply, Lewis has a rich series of environments and they all contribute to him in their different ways. Now you brought out the fact that he rubbed some people the wrong way because he was aggressive in his Christianity. Um, I can't recall the exact term that was used for him. Maybe I'm just uh, remembering incorrectly, but there was a, a sense in which this reputation as being kind of uh, maybe too forward or too, uh, as you noted, aggressive in his apologetics, uh, particularly with the Socratic club. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, Lewis um, was very happy to put his head above the parapet, so to speak. <laughs> uh, and of course, if you stick your head over the parapet, you get shot at. And, and Lewis, I think, was prepared to um, you know, take a few hits for the team, so to speak. Right. Um, but I don't think he found it very easy. I think, you know, if you look at some of his more personal reflections on being an apologist, he found it really quite demoralizing. Uh, he took a lot of, of criticism. He also wasn't as successful as he felt he ought to have been. So there is, there is a sense in Lewis himself that I'm not really doing my job very, very well, but I've got to keep going because who else is doing this sort of thing? Right. So there, there is that. I think that's a very important point to bring out. But I think that another thing which we haven't really touched on is that it's not just that people felt that Lewis was being slightly aggressive in his Christianity, it's not just they felt he was in effect writing popular books, it was actually Lewis simplified complex issues. And that I think was, was one of the reasons why Lewis's relationship with the Faculty of Theology in Oxford well, they weren't just frosty, they were non-existent, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And really, in fact, one of the breakthroughs for Lewis was when he was awarded an honorary Doctor of Divinity by the University of St. Andrews, a Doctor of Divinity yeah. by the Faculty of Divinity in St. Andrews because he pioneered a new approach to theology which they felt had real promise. It appealed to the imagination. Right, right. Mm. That's a beautiful thought. Now, his sort of move into what we now refer to as imaginative apologetics, uh, follows what, you know, we normally consider apologetics, a more didactic sort of approach. Um, 
Can you maybe develop a little bit uh, some reasoning or some 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 of the sort of the the causes for that uh, that move? Well, I think that there are several things here. One is, if you, if you read Surprised by Joy, Lewis is constantly um, emphasizing there's a rationalist way of looking at things, and then there's this rich imaginative way, this, which, is, um, you know, uh, which appeals to an I, a sort of a many-islanded sea of imagination. Of, it has real depth. And Lewis is saying that really, although he, he's a rational person, he is not limited to being a rational person. There's a deeper side to him, which is accessed by the imagination. If you like, reason may well help you to find truth, but the imagination helps you to find meaning. And that's much right. more significant. Right. So I think that there's that sense. But also, of course, if we ask who was Lewis reading, who influenced Lewis, one of the big influences is G.K. Chesterton. Right. And if you look at his apologetics, yes, there are very good rational arguments, but G.K. Chesterton tells stories. You know, and, and so you can see Lewis beginning to think that maybe there are other ways of doing this kind of thing. So in many ways, I think Lewis, if I put it like this, came to faith, not simply through rational reflection, but through imaginative engagement. Mm. And so if you like, maybe Lewis was writing for people who also wanted to come to faith through reason or imagination. In other words, not simply by showing Christianity is true, but it's also beautiful. It also captures the imagination. So in many ways, if you like, Lewis may well be using his own journey of faith as a resource for reaching out to an audience he knows is there because he used to be part of it. Now, am I remembering, remembering correctly that um, The Pilgrim's Regress was his first book after conversion? Yes. And that would be an example of what you're talking about, William. Um, it's an interesting book. Um, it, it's difficult to read. It's one of Lewis's least best well-selling books. But when you read it, you know, you, you could, despite Lewis's occasionally turgid prose, you can see the key idea. Hmm. There's an unexplained longing within our lives. It drives us to find where it's coming from. And when you find it, it transforms you. When you go back, where you came from, the regress bit of the argument, then you see things in a new way. So actually, an awful lot of Lewis's mature thinking is there in that book, but not well developed. And Lewis will develop it in later writings. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, that, that topic in particular, especially at a time where, I, I mean, I teach it similarly in this field where the, the kind of, the intellectual approach to the faith has been looked at very suspiciously, with especially questioning of modernity and, and that reason somehow is masking ways of, of kind of enforcing a meta narrative on people. So that approach to, to, to reaching out to people, Lewis was sort of ahead of the game here, where he, by tapping into these notions of imagination and these other dimensions of the human being beyond the intelligible, but yet also bringing the intelligible up kind of in, into a, a kind of a, a bigger uh, uh, sense of the human. Um, he really provides and supplies a lot of things that took theology in the academic sense a long time to catch up with. They're now writing on these topics, but he was talking about these things much earlier, even when he was shut out of the theology department. Well, I think he was, and, and in many ways what, what, what Lewis is doing is simply refusing to recognize categories and just saying, here's how I see things. So you have this very situation you know, where Lewis is, is not really modern, he's not really postmodern, yeah. but nevertheless he speaks to both modern both and postmodern without ever are actually self-identifying in that way. So you have this remarkable <laughs> situation where particularly in North America, you have people who love Lewis who are rationalists. Yes. And think, oh, this guy knows how to give an argument. <laughs> and then of those say, gosh, he writes those beautiful stories. He talks about beauty. Yeah. And they're coming from a different angle, but they both find Lewis a conduit into the world of faith for different reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I personally have been making the argument for a while now that I'm not sure that traditional apologetics, the rational style of apologetics, is effective anymore with the generation, at least with the college students I was teaching at the time that I left the university. And I, I'm increasingly convinced that we need an apologetic built around imagination and beauty. And I've been discovering more people who are doing that. But it seems to me that that's exactly where Lewis was 60 years ago. Oh, Lewis was there 60 years ago on steroids. <laughs> he, really, yeah. he, really, he really saw this. I think here's a key point we just need to talk about. You know, suppose I would say to you, I can prove 
that Jesus really did rise again from the dead on the third day. My audience is going to say, well, that's very nice to know, so what? Yeah. You know, it's a so what that's question. Exactly. And that, that's what, that's you're what I at. saw with my, with my students. Exactly. And Lewis, in effect, saying, look, this stuff makes sense, but here is the difference it makes. It's all about meaning, not just truth. You know, uh, reason brings you to truth, imagination brings you to meaning, and the key thing is you need meaning. Now, you look at um, psychologists like Crystal Park uh, and others like that, what are they saying? We are looking for goodness, we are looking for beauty, we are looking for meaning, and that's what people are looking for in their lives. And you know, you didn't read very much of Lewis to say that he's talking about these things, he's actually answering questions people are asking. And that's why I think he is very good. He reassures us Christianity makes sense, but he does not limit Christianity to making sense of things. It's bigger than that. So let's think a little bit about uh, Men Without Chess, because I think this is where we're heading here when, we th when we're talking about meaning. So if we think about, say, the, the, the three parts of a person that Lewis is referring to in the abolition of man, the head, which would be reason, the appetites, which would be the stomach or the belly, and then the chest would be that place that's negotiating sort of the, the kind of the, 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 the two poles, um, exercising what I would say is critical judgment in the, in the sense of what you're describing, what's the thing I should do, what's meaningful at this point. Then if we think about getting back, I, maybe this is a bad thing to, to talk about, but it seems to me as I just right now thinking out loud with regard to the Pilgrim's Regress, the northern countries are the rational, the southern countries, so that's, there's that road that goes straight east and west in the story, and Lewis is describing his own journey going north into the reason, you know, so the, the land of the rational. But there is this sort of southern sort of marshy area, which is the sort of the region of the appetites. Kind of the ideal is to be in the middle, but it's not just uh, a kind of a, an Aristotelian middle way. It's more of a kind of a, 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 the region in which these things are brought together. So the further north you go, the more rational you get, the more insane it becomes. The further south you go, the more sort of uh, the appetites consume you, and there's a kind of insanity the further south you go. But this, this middle area where the meaning is found, where you bring these two things together. Am I kind of just uh, kind of spinning my wheels, or is there something to what I just said? <laughs> Well, you are spinning your wheels, but there is, there is, there is, there is, there is something, there is something here. So let, let's, let's just tease that. I mean, here, here for me is one of the big things Lewis is very, very good at. You say, you know, we need to go too far north and too far south. You need a map which tells you when you've gone too right. far north, when too far south. And that is one of the things I think Lewis is very, very good at, which is that he presents Christianity as something which, in effect, um, you can go north, you can go south, because both those are legitimate elements. But if you, if you kind of bypass one of them, you've lost it. You've got to have them both. Right. And Lewis is really exploring how you could hold these things together. He does that, and to some extent, the Pilgrim's regress, but he does it, of course, um, in um, The Abolition of Man, which also didn't sell very well because it's just too hard to read. But um, basically, the idea is there that we've got to find a way of a achieving a middle way. And Lewis, in effect, um, tends to use narratives to show us what that middle way is. And in many ways, you could say that um, the Chronicles of Narnia is trying to articulate articulate in a very visualizable way the rather abstract points Lewis is making in the abolition of man. All right, all right. Very interesting. Hmm. One of the things I, 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 was, I was thinking about here is um, Lewis had to deal with, on the, on the one hand, kind of a thick rationalist scientism to which he was speaking into, which held a, a strong sway in, in those days. Um, probably the first phases of sort of relativism coming in on, on the other end. Um, and, and similarly, um, the way that he approached apologetics wouldn't be the kind of modern rationalist approach strictly, but nor would it be the reactionary kind of Bardian approach that sort of cut off that creation still, still has a way of testifying. Um, and you've done a little writing of this on your own in the retrieval of kind of a theology of nature. Um, how significant is what Lewis is up to there, theologically speaking, for developing something like a, a, a strong theology of nature that allows us not to get too far off on the 
hyper rationalism nor the the kind of uh, just kind of constructing meaning out of our own resources. Well, I think the best book to look at here would probably be, be the discarded image, right. which actually, you know, you know, it was published posthumously, but it's really based on the lectures Lewis gave here in Oxford to undergraduates. And what he is trying to do is to tease out how to make sense of the natural world you need some kind of framework. And he's talking about the, the discarded image, in other words, the moral of the universe that they had in the Middle Ages. And Lewis is making the point that while there are questions that need to be asked about this medieval way of thinking, it nevertheless gives you a framework which does two things. It makes sense of what you observe. And number two, it helps you figure out how you fit into this. And number three, it gives you a, a framework for living which is, which, where you can live meaningfully. And what Lewis is saying really is, in his view, a purely scientific view of the world, which he would date from probably the 18th century onwards, actually is not answering that second bunch of questions. And therefore, scientism, I mean, Lewis uses the word occasionally, not very much, but, but it's there. A, a way of looking into the world which relies solely on science is is going to give you a vision of the universe which is cold, meaningless, dark, and empty. Right. And Lewis is not necessarily saying the medieval worldview is right, although he makes it clear he likes it, right. but he is saying this delivers this existential payload, if you like, mm -hmm. which is what you really need if you're going to live meaningfully in the world. It reminds me of a book by Remy Bragg entitled The Wisdom of the World, in which he talks about the older way of thinking of the world as a thing that is an embodiment of wisdom that we can form ourselves to, as opposed to just some kind of object that we study from a distance and try to master. Um, and that reminds me of that section in The Abolition of Man where Lewis is, just, is talking about what wisdom entailed in the past, this conforming to reality as opposed to trying to master it. And it seems to me that, and by the way, I think probably my favorite work by Lewis is The Discarded Image. And it, it, it struck me as, as fascinating that Michael Ward in his work, Planet Narnia, brings to the surface some things that maybe we should have always seen and just weren't able to see because we just didn't know how to see them. But after you, it's like one of those things where you, when, when you see something you can't stop seeing it because it finally it just kind of is it's evident everywhere. But it's just it's so clear that you know, the Ransom Trilogy, the Chronicles of Narnia, his poetry is all inspired by this discarded image, this, this vision of the way things were. Is there any way that maybe we can get back to that? Um, in other words, the idea that the, the world itself, the way it's, it's ordered, can inform us and make us wise as opposed to just us coming to it and trying to make it do what we want. I think um, what I take away from Lewis is this. We have to learn to respect the scientific way of looking at things on its own terms. Not saying it's wrong or anything like that, saying this is the way a scientist look at things, that's really important. We need to know how our universe functions. But there is a lot more that needs to be said. And what Lewis, I think, is doing is saying, let's think about what else needs to be added to this. Because we were talking a few moments ago about um, you know, the, the, the so what question. Well, you know, okay, so the universe is 13.8 billion years old. I mean, sure, but so what? I mean, what, what difference does that make to me? And so what Lewis is saying is that we need to find a way which does not involve the contradiction of science, but simply the rejection of the idea that science says everything that there is to be said about this. And it needs supplementation, enrichment with something more than this. And so Lewis, in effect, uh, particularly in, I think, um, that beautiful sermon at Oxford in June 1941, The Weight of Glory, you know, he gives you this wonderful framework from which you can begin to, in effect, re-enchant the natural world. And I think that's very, very powerful. It's not saying no to science, it's saying thank you very much indeed, let's add to this, let's build on this, there's more that needs to be said. And that, I think, is important, that it's one of the reasons why scientism is so unsatisfactory is it limits reality to what science can say. Yeah. Uh, but existential reality is bigger than that, and that's very important for ordinary people. So are you familiar with C.P. Snow's The Two Cultures? In other words, the, the humanities and the sciences and kind of the inability for them to speak to each other? Is, is that work C.P. Snow's... Uh, uh, well, I, th I think Lewis, if I include like this, um, 
Louis doesn't really, isn't really a scientist, but he is aware of the cultural impact of science, and he's aware of how we got to this point historically. I think what he is saying again is that we need more than this if we're going to live authentic lives. And in doing that, he's drawing on, um, I would argue, the kind of natural philosophy you find in the 16th century, early 17th century, which in effect is just saying we need, we need more than this, that understanding how the universe functions isn't enough. How do we fit into this? Right. So, I mean, do you have any thoughts on how to proceed? I mean, um, when I think about, say, someone like Jonathan Edwards, who uh, is obviously a theologian and a pastor, but also an... A, a, an amateur scientist. He wrote a uh, work on spiders, for example. Yep, yep. Um, is it possible for, say, scientists to receive some uh, input from people like me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, w I would think so, and I hope that input would not be your wrong. Right. I think, I think uh, the input I, I would suggest is that's really interesting. There's more that needs to be said. In other words, I want to amplify, I want to build on this. I think uh, Jonathan Edwards is a good example because you're quite right. Edwards, you know, really was quite an advocate of the sciences. I mean, he advocated vaccination, you remember, right. which that, killed that him. Didn't work out very well. <laughs> did it? Um, that wasn't that wasn't his fault. Um, but you know, when you read Edwards reflecting as he walks in the Raritan Valley, you know, and and his sense of the the sweet amusement, this this um, experience of Christ and everything he sees. Yeah. You know, what you can do is say, look, I'm looking at the world through a scientific lens. Mm. You know, I, I see certain things. I don't see others. I put a different lens on, and, and now I can see other things. So in effect, it's almost like saying we need to use a scientific lens, we need to use a theological lens. We need multiple lenses to really appreciate the depths of the world. Scientism says only one lens, science, yeah. tough. Um, Lewis is saying, and then there, there, there are several, and if you don't use them all, you're impoverished. Right. You know, when you look at the transactions of the Royal Philosophical Society from the period into probably the early 1800s, what you will find are scientists, as we would describe them, they call themselves natural philosophers, of course, who will be making observations about the world and will be drawing scientific conclusions from them, who will then start adding moral conclusions and spiritual lessons and, and things like that as a matter of course because they saw the physical world that they were studying as integrated within a moral and spiritual universe. They saw no contradiction there and one flowed naturally into the other and that was all cut off by 19th century scientism. You know, so it would be really difficult, I suspect, to convince scientists to try to do that again, but there's nothing to say that it couldn't be done. There's nothing to say we can't recover the old division of natural philosophy and say that really the engagement with nature is not simply saying, here is how it functions. It's also saying, how do we live meaningfully and authentically in the natural world? And certainly if you look at early works of natural philosophy, as the ones you've just been talking about, those themes are there. Yeah. Even if you look at a popular work of natural philosophy like um, Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, which is very much about a man on a desert island trying to figure out what this place is, <laughs> but also what he's meant to be doing there. You know, and, and, and you can see these questions begin to bubble up. So I think we can reinvigorate them and, and kind of way bring them back because one of the problems we're having in a very technocratic culture is, and we can do all of these things, but we haven't figured out quite how we should do them and what's right and what's good and also what's good for us. And so I think, you know, there's, there's a cultural need to begin to bring all these things back together again. So along that line with the rise of the transhumanist project, sort of uh, operating in ourselves, which again, Lewis saw, and uh, you know, we see in the abolition of man, but also in that hideous strength. By the way, that was just a, a I think that with every passing year, he, he appears in my mind to grow in relationship to other hmm. writers like Orwell and Huxley. It's almost as though it's a prophecy as opposed to just a dystopia. But what, what can we do to speak to this sort of trend to operate on ourselves and to, instead of uh, recognize our humanity, to try to transform ourselves into 
or, or merge with the machine and make ourselves into some kind of semi-divine or demigod or whatever. Well, I think um, one of the things we could do is we can look at the reaction to um, that hideous strength when it appeared in, was it August the 13th, 1945, here in Britain? Um, because that was just after the two detonations of atomic bombs in Japan. And actually, the, the, the reaction to Lewis's, uh, that hideous strength was, this is, this is a real problem. What happens if science takes steps that put us in a new place and we can't go back and we can't cope with a new place we're in? Hmm. And you know, in many ways, Lewis is raising some very powerful questions there. And I think that those remain very much on our agenda today. But I think they've become even more focused, which is all to do with um, recent anxieties about artificial intelligence. And the key question here is, um, who's doing the programming? You know, who, who in effect is deciding what is rational? And when you look at studies of um, how AI works, it tends to be very gendered, um, very um, culturally determined, you know, and, and, and really what you have is, it's almost like a battleground for which vision of rationality is going to win out in the end. And that, I think, is a real concern. And Lewis, I think, anticipates that, um, in, particularly in that hideous strength. But you can see hints of it, actually, earlier in his writings. Right. Do you have any writers that you think are kind of able to point a direction forward for us? I mean, is, there, is there anything going on today that you're encouraged by? Well, I, I, lots of people are really expressing anxieties about this. And you might think of the, the very recent book, um, Playing God. Uh, which had just come out. And actually, that, 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 that gives you a very good sense of these new questions that are emerging very often from scientific advance not being adequately coupled to human in in uh, responses to these. In other words, we're doing things <laughs> and can't control them. And I think that, that a lot of people are talking about these things. The question is, how, is it too late to actually stop this? Right. And Lewis, I think in many ways, was a prophet who saw these things and raised questions. I, I'm not sure he gives us answers. Right. I, if I, if I'm good like that. Right. But so I'm what? I'm still rooting for Merlin. Yeah, yeah, yeah but you see, he, he, by, by raising these questions and then stepping back a bit, he invites us to say, well, can you see I'm right? You need to think about these things. Now, what are you going to do about, about it? it. Yeah. Um, well, that's the, that's the kind of place I think we often find ourselves as we're seeing some of the technological advances advance beyond what we know how to run with. And we heard the, well, some of us are here hearing these kind of prophets warning us. Mm. But now, you know, how do we build on a wealth of wisdom and insight for these people that drew from the, the more rich yeah. aspects of our Christian faith to address them? And not just to speak to where we think the dangers are, but how to enact lives that go a different direction. You know, that don't, don't follow where some of these dangers could lead. And, and, and how significant is, is carving out that aspect? That's the sort of the theme. Well, that, that's the thing, though, that Tom, I'm, I'm wanting to get at, because I think that since, since Mary Shelley, we've had warnings about where this is all going to take us. Yeah. The question is, is what do we do about it? Yeah. And is there anybody writing about something more than the question? Yeah. <laughs> In other words, is, are there just some people proffering some answers that maybe have some, have some chance of actually being helpful? Well, Lewis, it, when you think about it, Lewis isn't really into giving answers to these questions. Lewis is, is far too intelligent to do that. Lewis, what Maybe Lewis we is, need an idiot who's willing to. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, listen to what I'm going to say. Because what Lewis is saying is what we need are exemplars, not just people who say wise things, people who live wisely. Okay. We need okay. exemplars. And of okay. course, what is Lewis doing in his fiction? Right. He's modeling wise conduct. Right. And he's in effect saying we need to learn from other people who have, who have thought about these things and are wise, not necessarily right. because we're going to replicate them, but because in effect they give us a vision for an alternative a way of thinking about these things and possibly a way of enacting this or embodying this. Right. So for right. me, Lewis is really recapturing that ancient wisdom tradition, right. which is it doesn't, it's not just about ideas, it's yeah. about a lived life which shows this wisdom. Right. Uh, it comes to mind as Alistair McIntyre and oh, that virtue well. ethics. Yes, that's right. So basically, the idea is instead of having a vision mm -hmm. for the future, let's focus on moral formation of people. Because there's no way we can fully anticipate every decision the person is going to have to make, but we want to have the right person making the decision. I guess that's what I'm, what I'm hearing you say. 
Well, what I'm saying is that um, you cannot say, here are 65 problems we're having. Answer number one, this. Answer number 65, this. What you've got to say is, in effect, a person who has a, a wise character yeah. is going to be able to look at these things and hopefully find their way to a good conclusion, either on their own or in dialogue with a community of wisdom. Right. And that, that, that's a classic uh, model, but right. it's actually one that we, we're neglecting. And I think that Lewis is right. We don't want to go down the technocratic route. We don't want to go down the solipsistic, here's my answer, it's right for everyone. It's yeah, rather yeah. reflecting on situation in dialogue with wise figures from the present and the past. And of course, for Lewis, the past is really important. The past may be dead, it still speaks to us, and it speaks very often wisely. I think that's a, a great kind of a next step in, in, in what we're talking about, is for Lewis, classic sources and being formed by them tends to be a spiritual exercise and a formative exercise. It speaks much about, of course, he loved finding all the old books here, and he loved books. Yeah. When he read authors, he was shaped by them, and he wanted us to be shaped by them, at least the better better aspects. Um, that was all tied up with his, his sort of vision of education, but also moral formation. And so when he read a work, oftentimes he kind of distilled it. He didn't always tell you what he was drawing off of. Maybe his colleagues mm -hmm. would have known. But a lot of us are getting a wealth of education when you read a book of his that is drawn off of all that wisdom and formation in a way that's accessible to a lot of us who don't necessarily have the expertise to it. Um, how significant is then his story in that moral and spiritual formation um, for us? I think one of the things I appreciate about Lewis is when I read Lewis, if you like, Lewis is a gateway or a conduit to an awful lot of people who are behind him, but who he's read and reaching these opinions. And so by, by tracking them back and reading them, actually yeah. I'm able to kind of way enter into his process of reasoning. So if you like, Lewis is not simply somebody who gives us food for thought. Yeah. In effect, you like, he steps back and says, there's where it comes from. Uh, yeah. And so I think that's very important as yeah. well. Yeah. Also, I think, I think for Lewis, there is this very strong sense of, uh, in effect, um, um, recognizing you are part of an ongoing tradition of discussion and you can learn from that discussion. The conversation began before you did and you can join the conversation and benefit from what went beforehand. Yeah. So how do we, how do we valorize that? We live in a time where people tear down statues and deface things that uh, you know, are historic in terms of their you know, pointing back to those very sources that, that you know, you've noted. Um, the dead white male phenomenon, that kind of stuff. How do we, how do we recover uh, uh, the kind of piety, the kind of respect for, regard for our patrimony? Well, um, Lewis isn't here to speak, um, but here's what I think Lewis would say. I think Lewis would say that we are very, very good at finding reasons for disregarding the past altogether. And so we'll reject it for all kinds of reasons, well, some of which may be meritorious, some of them may be purely spurious. But the key point is that for Lewis, people are desperately trying to deny the past and simply say we make up our own minds without reference to what's been before us. And Lewis is simply saying that that, that leads in some very bad ways and we need to remain con anchored to a tradition of wisdom if we're going to be able to cope with these questions we're now facing. Now, in your own life, are there luminaries from the past that you uh, find particularly helpful? Well, Lewis. I mean, <laughs> I mean if, if I can get personal for a moment. I mean, when I um, began my Christian life after having been an atheist, coming to Oxford, becoming a Christian, and then pestering my um, Christian friends, you know, why, why do you guys believe in the Trinity or what, whatever it was? And they, they, well, let me put it like this. They, they, A, couldn't answer the questions, and B, they got a bit fed up with this. And I think possibly in desperation, one of them said, why don't you start reading C.S. Lewis? Okay. I, and I hadn't really read C.S. Lewis up to this point. This is back in 1974, which is a long time ago. Uh, and so I went to uh, Blackwell's bookstore here in Oxford, just actually around the corner, uh, with a book token I'd be given for my birthday, and found a book by Lewis called uh, They Asked for a Paper. And it included his theology poetry. And that actually did two things. One, it said, this is wonderful. Christianity makes sense. And number two, I think this guy could be my friend. 
you know, and actually he's been my traveling companion through life ever since. Yeah. So I think, I think that's one source, but of course there are others. I think one of the things we have to do is to say we all of us need to find these traveling companions of wisdom who will help us think things through. Lewis might be one of them, it might be G.K. Chesterton, it might be Jonathan Edwards, you know, yeah. the list could go on, but the key point is we need these reference points, not necessarily to tell us what's right, but to help us think these things through. Right, right. Are there any places in maybe your sphere of influence or just things that you're aware of that are giving you some encouragement in that particular regard? Maybe schools or uh, different people who are, who are trying to, basically getting the message out to, to do what you just described? Well, well, one of the things I do find quite reassuring is that C.S. Lewis continues to sell. Yeah. You know, and, and in effect, you know, if someone, if someone stops selling, it's very often an indication that the culture's moved on or th this was okay for, for my grandfather, but not for me. But actually, you have very often, and I've met families who, the grandchildren, the father, and the, you know, they're, all, they're all reading Lewis because he speaks perhaps in different ways to different generations. So I'm not saying Lewis is the only resource. I'm just saying it's that the kind of thing we need. Right, right, right. Any thoughts, Glenn, about any of this or Tom? Well, I, I'm, I'm like Chris, I came to Lewis through Tolkien, it was the imagination mm. that grabbed me. Mm. Um, you know, for me, Middle Earth was a compelling place because it was so obviously deep and internally consistent, and I just found that work of imagination utterly, well, compelling. Mm. And from there, I moved, actually, I believe for me it was to the Ransom Trilogy, and then I found out about Narnia. I didn't know any of this stuff until I was in college. Um, and I only got into his apologetic work and his work, you know, his other works later. Mm. Um, so for me, the imaginative side has always been from the heart for, of Lewis. And I continue and, you know, as I said before, I think that the imaginative side is what's really desperately needed now. And the stories that he tells, the vision he portrays, is, I think, continues to be incredibly compelling on that level. Um, we had someone on the podcast a little while ago who commented that, you know, there are a lot of people out there who are trying to be the next C.S. Lewis or the next J.R.R. Tolkien, and they all fail. And the reason they fail, she said, is because they haven't read what Lewis has read. They haven't read what Tolkien has read. They don't have that formation of, of the, the depth of, of preparation to enable them to do that kind of creation. So I suppose what that points to is uh, an education in classics, an education you know, anchored in... Um, in Plato, in um, you know, an earlier thought, and probably as well in folklore. Well, I think that's right. I think that um, if you look at either Tolkien or Lewis, there's a massive um, resource they're drawing on. I mean, Lewis and Tolkien are reading different people, I have to say, but you're quite right, they're immersed in them, and they're able to um, draw on this almost like deposit of wisdom. And so when, when you read Tolkien or Lewis, you have this sense that you're encountering not simply a single writer, but a body of wisdom which actually speaks to us. And so I think that, that's very, very true. I mean, I mean, if you take, I mean, if you, if you take Lewis's lectures here in Oxford, which I referred to, which have become the scarlet image, I mean, those was well oversubscribed. You know, I mean, the huge number of students went to them. And it was partly because Lewis was a very good lecturer in terms of his um, ability to hold their attention. But the key thing that some of them say in their letters is it's because he'd internalized these people and figured out why they were important and what you could do with them. And so I think that's a really important point. I, I think it's not just enough to say, read Tolkien, read Lewis. You've got to say, let me tell you what you might find or let me tell you how this might help you to move on. So we've got to make sure we don't just refer people to these and, and leave them on their own. You might want to, in effect, say, here's what I found. Do you see that? Does that help you? So again, we need mentors, figures of wisdom to help access both Lewis and Tolkien and move things ahead. Now, when I was a child, 
that's how I came into Lewis, and it wasn't through mere Christianity or discarded image. It was, of course, through Narnia, act, kind of accidentally, a little library excursion or something. But all I remember was the desire of wanting to know what a Turkish delight was. <laughs> we didn't have them where I'm from. And it did stir to, to where, when I finally arrived here and was able to find some, was one of the things I kind of got a little... That's why you came to England. That's, that's why right. I'm back, too. <laughs> but anyway, that, that sort of tells something about him, of course, with the desire. But just to, to make a little switch, if it's okay, that you yourself have been inspired much by Lewis, as you mentioned, and you have been a significant apologist for the Christian faith in the context of Oxford. And I know it had a, a, a huge impact on, on me, and I, I think a lot of introduced by, by uh, Dr. Henson here um, when I was a student. Um, just starting out, you're, you're coming from atheism and you're coming from a very hard intellectual environment. What did you find when you found Lewis that drew you in? Well, I came to Christianity from atheism, from what I would now call scientism, because my, my first two degrees were in science here at Oxford, and also from a Marxist background. You know, I, you know, if you go back to the late 1960s, looking around, a lot of you may not know that intellectual environment, but in the late 1960s, Marxism was very, very big. It was the future. And then it kind of fizzled away. Seems to have made a comeback. <laughs> well, it's making a comeback in a rather half-hearted way. <laughs> but um, my, my, the point I would make is that I, one of the things I learned from Marxism was you need a big picture, mm. which makes sense of the world and gives you a role within it. I didn't find that in other ways of thinking, but I find it in Christianity. And Lewis brings that out very, very clearly. I think that's a really important point to make. But my own case, apologetics, really, you know, my basic view is, look, um, I, as an atheist, I did not understand what Christianity was. I've read Lewis, he's very, very good. Um, I'm coming from a slightly different background. My background is scientific rather than yeah. literary. And therefore, maybe I can help my fellow scientists see there's a bigger picture of life that needs to be discovered. So that I've kind of way found my own niche in trying to do that. And you've drawn off of more, I mean, of course, mm. more sources. Now, I remember, this is working off 20 some years ago, one seminar now. Remember him telling a story also the significance of Bart's first dogmatics versus for it for you. Someone advised you to read it, is that correct? That's right. And I remember you saying something to the effect that it was a good thing it wasn't Maurice Wiles. <laughs> That's right. Well, um, that is true, I'm afraid, because um, as, a, as a scientist, um, I did talk to friends of mine who were theologians and um, wasn't really very impressed by what I found. And then someone introduced me to Karl Barth. Yeah. So you ought to read him, so I... I got the church dogmatics and began to read at the very beginning and suddenly found this makes sense this is intellectually rigorous and so when I, when I eventually got a prize for the top first class honest degree in theology and I took it it was quite a generous prize so I bought Ch Bart's church dogmatics <laughs> <laughs> so I could read it through and I only read it four times I have to say um, but that was enough because it, this, this is intellectually serious yeah. not just spiritually nourishing, very important, but also intellectual rigorously and able to hold its head up high in the academic world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's very important. So you brought up the fact that uh, you were a Marxist and it was a big picture that helped you. Yeah. So there are a number of other, I think, well, I have a theory or uh, something I've thought about. It seems like many of the best conservatives were former Marxists. You, know, you think of Whitt Whitaker Chambers or Christopher Lash or somebody like, uh, you know, Alistair, uh, McIntyre. Yes, indeed. You know, so what is it about um, the background in Marxism that actually makes you a better conservative? Maybe, maybe you don't agree with me on that point, but <laughs> well, it just no. seems like that, that well, seems to be the case. Basically, um, if you ask, Marxism is a worldview. Right. What does the worldview do? Well, first of all, it gives you an account of the world you're in. And then secondly, it says, here's what you can do to live within it and make it a better place. Hmm. So in other words, it's all about values, it's all about your personal place, your personal role. And eventually I decided, mainly because I had read people like Karl Popper, that Marxism actually wasn't such a good idea. But the idea of having a big picture, right. which made sense of things and also helped me to find my place within it. Right. Now, do you understand why I like C.S. Lewis so much? Right. What was the first essay I read by C.S. Lewis? 
is theology poetry. How does that end? Um, it's a dramatic and remarkable statement. I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. And I thought that, that, that works. Right. That means I fit into the world, I can see what it is, I can see what I'm meant to be doing, I'm going to read more about this. Right. So if you like, um, for me, Lewis helped me to see Christianity as a big picture of reality, not just a set of pietistic declarations about what you should be doing. Or how Jesus can make my best life now. Right. You know, in other words, try to fit Jesus into sort of my agenda, yes. my, my, my goals, mm. to, and he becomes sort of the, the, the personal life coach to help me achieve my goals. And it's also about coherence, because that's a really big theme. Because right. if, if Lewis is right, uh, then Christianity is saying this world is coherent, it's just that we don't see the coherence. Right. And that, that's a really important point, because if you think of earlier writers like John Donne, you know, writing in 1611, you know, he's just saying it's all falling to pieces, no coherence at all, because of the radical philosophy of his day. Right, right. He wants it to make sense. And Lewis is in fact saying, it does make sense. Right. And you can find your place within it. And a lot of people need to know that. Well, the, the Lagos and the Antas here seem to me to relate to each other. So it seems like every generation in the world is falling apart. I mean, you read history and it seems like that's the perennial complaint, the world is falling apart. But, it's, but it hasn't yet because there is a God who's holding it together. It has a coherence. And then we can understand that coherence and work with it. Um, so I, I, guess, I guess I'm just trying to recapitulate what you just said in my own way. Um, so we have a lot of listeners t uh, who are young. Our, our audience ranges, uh, you know, across the age spectrum. But I think that probably most of our listeners are between the ages of 25 and say 45. So it's a, it's a pretty healthy slice. Um, if you wanted to encourage those folks, or I asked, you know, encouraged you to encourage them, what would you say to them about? maybe what you think is coming, you know, that could be encouraging to them. I think none of us know what is coming. What we do know is that we need to base our lives on something that we have not invented. Yes. Something that's real, something that in effect we can trust, something which is not saying everything's going to be fine. It's not optimism, it's hope. And hope is not the same as optimism. Hope is saying even if the future is awful, we can still live meaningfully and hopefully because we know there's something better awaiting us. Mm -hmm. And we need that sort of thing. Right. What I want to say is it seems to me that what we're seeing in the way the world's behaving at the moment is a collapse of worldviews because they are not doing the job. And so it's raising questions in the people's minds, particularly in the age range you just mentioned, 25 to 45, is there a better way of thinking and living? Mm -hmm. I think there is, and that's why I think really what Lewis is saying, what Christianity is saying, is so powerful and important. Right, right. That's good stuff. Now, is there something in your uh, study of Lewis that you wish people were more aware of or appreciated more than they do now? I think what I'd want to say um, to anybody who asks that question is this. Um, when you look at everything that we know about Lewis. He was dealt a very bad hand in life. You know, he had a thumb defect, he couldn't type, you know. I didn't know uh, that. Couldn't drive a car, you know, oh yes. I mean, and uh, he was born in Northern Ireland. That's not, that's not a good place to come from. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and yet, when you look at what Lewis did, remarkable. Uh, and in my office, I have a picture of Lewis taken in um, April 1917. And Lewis is standing there looking at the camera. And I know what sort of things he'd be thinking. And what he would be thinking is something like, am I going to be alive in six months' time? Because he was training to go and fight in World War I. And here's the point I want to make. Would Lewis have been thinking, one day I'm going to be the best known Christian apologist in the world? <laughs> No, he was an atheist. Right. And he was worried he was going to be dead in six months. And it's all about divine providence. So I would right. like to say that hold that image in mind. Right. That actually things change. People who very often seem hopeless cases right. become transformed. And Lewis, right. I think, is a very good example of someone who would bear witness to that transformational capacity of the grace of God. No, which is an interesting, I, I think, critique or at least um, challenge to this idea that we can make our lives. That we kind of, we're encouraged, I think, 
uh, by many well-meaning people to kind of look ahead, get in touch with our passionate side, what do we want to do, and we go out and we try to create our futures based on this sense mm -hmm. of, this is what I think I'm made for. Anybody who's lived any bit, you know, any length of time realizes that a lot of the stuff I thought I should do, I was really dumb. It was really <laughs> stupid stuff. <Yes. laughs> and then something comes along, and it just like out of the blue, left field. I didn't didn't anticipate it. It like in Lewis's case, probably in your case. Am I right? Yep. You, know, you were in the sciences, and now you're known as an apologist, <laughs> primarily. Obviously, you still have a love for the sciences. And well, I do, yes. Because I had lunch with my research supervisor here at Oxford, still alive, about two weeks ago. <laughs> and that was a great experience. He wanted to talk about religion. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's a, well, that's an interesting point, is, is how do you see, I mean, especially since, you know, again, there, there have been different times where there's been more hostility from the sciences towards religion to a, a kind of, uh, you know, a kind of maybe a tolerable... You know, relationship to maybe you seeing more openness to minor. Well, here's what I would want to say. I mean, we may be seeing hostility towards religion, but um, one of the best antidotes to that is for each of us to have friends who are scientists who will take us seriously, and, and in effect, we as people can exercise an influence. There's a very interesting research paper by um, Elaine Graham at Rice University, a sociologist, and she was looking at what sort of things make people change their mind. Is it the book they've read? Well, maybe a bit, but no. It's mostly, do they know somebody who's both a scientist and a Christian who has scientific credibility but can talk about religious things? Because then that has plausibility in their sight. And then that's a very important point. So one of the points I'd want to make to anyone listening to this is basically um, friendships, relationships really matter in apologetics because it's all about trusting you and hence coming to trust what you stand for. Right, right. Which makes me think about the relationship between Lewis and Tolkien. We were just talking about this earlier. The friendship came first and it was built around some common interests, northernness, you know, their interest in language and so forth. And then I imagine that when Tolkien met Lewis, he maybe came across as, a, well, a, a person who was a, kind of a, a confident atheist. And yet, through their relationship, we see God used uh, God uses Tolkien uh, as an instrument to bring Lewis into the Christian faith, which is a marvelous thing to consider. Um, so this, this, uh, the importance of friendship, uh, making friends with scientists, but also people who maybe are not part of the Christian faith, and maybe we can't even imagine being part of the Christian faith, is, is significant. Um, when it comes to this role of friendship in the pursuit of truth, do you have any thoughts to share with us about that? I mean, when we think about, say, Aristotle and the significance he places on friendship, Lewis and the four loves, and, you know, and it seems as though we all know friends are important, but maybe we don't take friendship seriously enough. Any thoughts on that? Well, you're quite right to point to Aristotle. You're quite right to point to Lewis, of course, because in the four loves, friendship is the, one of the big things there, isn't it? And I think one of the things I, I, that I see looking at Lewis's career as how important friends were to him. And you've already mentioned the, the way in which um, Tolkien actually played quite an important role, not necessarily in bringing Lewis to believe in God, but certainly in moving Lewis from believing simply in a right. generic God to, to Christianity, right. and also to appreciating the um, immense theological importance of, of narratives. That's really important. What I would say, I think, is this, that actually, um, as I understand friendship, friendship is about wanting to share what really matters to you and having somebody who's willing to listen to you and, and you receive from them as well. And I think that actually Lewis illustrates that point very, very well. And perhaps it suggests that actually apologetics and evangelism take place at many levels. But actually, a particularly privileged mode of apologetics is personal relationships personal conversations, right. because very often those have um, a kind of authority or plausibility, which very often reading a book or somebody who you don't know won't have at all. Right. Sometimes I think some, there's an attempt to instrumentalize friendship, in other words, friendship evangelism, 
where maybe the friendship isn't genuine. Yeah, go make some friends in London. That's, right. yeah. that's right. That's right. Friends so you have to actually conversion. make friends. You have yeah. to be like this a This is friend. about being, being <laughs> real friends. Yeah. Right. Mm. But it was, it, was, it was very similar. I mean, I remember as a student here at some of the, the formal halls and stuff. And of course, I was a student around people from every kind of background, atheists, you know, people would throw every kind of argument at me. And usually at the end of the day, you could argue or talk about it. It really just, it ended with most people left in the same situation. But it was really through those thick kind of rela inner, inner relationships you developed where you, you kind of continued those conversations and you built on them and built, built meaningful relationships. It's, you know, I've even seen people come to faith that way. It, it is very powerful to talk about the relational dimensions of, well, I think reality, and I think that's something Lewis would have been attuned to as well, that, that, that relationship isn't just one being over against another, but it is this deep, this deep relational resonance that is, is, is not simply there as a byproduct of an indifferent universe, but it's built right into the fabric of creation. Yeah, perhaps friendship is a, is a rebuke of the indifferent universe. Yeah. You know, because everybody longs for friendship, and and most of us, perhaps the vast majority of us, have had a friend. You know, somebody who was genuinely interested in our welfare, and it wasn't, we weren't just simply uh, a means to an end, but an end that they were interested in, in acknowledging and, and serving. Yeah, some things to think about. Yeah. Well, Lewis, I just got, I'll come back to him. I mean, Lewis does think have a, a further type of friend that we might bring into this conversation, which is people who read Lewis's books mm. and very often were converted by reading. Think of Ruth Pitter, for example, you know, the poetess. Um, but but and so Lewis very often would dialogue with people in correspondence, and actually. One of the things that often strikes me is looking at Lewis's letters and just wondering how on earth he managed to write so oh, many. Oh, I, I feel so guilty when I hear about that. Like, I, I get, you know, notes from people from different places, and I'm like, how did he carve out the time? And, and answer that question. Well, and, and that's actually related to what I was going to say. We have a difficult time with friendship, I think, because we actually live in an analog world, but we act like we're living a digital world. Um, the internet, e communication, all of those kinds of things makes us treat friendships as something that's virtual. And you, friendships don't operate typically on that level. They're things that occur at an analog level, not a digital level. And I think that, that poses a real barrier to us, just in terms of our lifestyle and the pace that we live. I think you're right. And I take that further, we've already used the word instrumentalize. I mean, if you look at the internet, I mean, people instrumentalize their friends to get likes. No, right. Yeah. Right. I mean, and I mean that, that's worrying. And I think that yeah. one of the things I, I personally learned during the, the COVID pandemic was how important face-to-face -face interaction right. with people is. Right. Not just um, my friends, but also my research students, yeah. because very often they wanted they wanted support. They wanted to know yeah. somebody there for them. Yeah. And actually, right. you cannot you cannot really convey that by a remote screen of some sort. It has to be a personal interaction. And I think Lewis is very, very good at bringing that point out. And actually, Lewis's own personal history brings out just how important that is. You know, I think one. I think the last thing I'd like to to present for your comment uh, before we wrap up our time together. Maybe you guys. I don't mean to cut you out or anything. <laughs> You have some other things you would like to ask, that's fine. But I noted in your treatment of Lewis and your biography of him that uh, he was uh, disappointed with the fact that he wasn't able to uh, win over some of the people who were closest that's to right. him. Uh, he is loved by people who are far away, in, in some cases, I mean, on the other side of the world, the United States, but some of the people who are closest to him and see him on a daily basis continue to reject the Christian faith and die that way. How are we to sort of make sense of that? I mean, the, the impression I have of Lewis is that he's a, he's a human being, he's got his limitations, he's got his faults, but he's an admirable man and a, a reasonable one. Uh, why is it that we have a hard time receiving from people we know and defer to people who are far away? 
I, that's a very good question. I mean, the people you're probably thinking of would be Arthur Greaves, his very yeah. close childhood friend, and of course, uh, Mrs. Moore. Right. You know, who um, <laughs> thought Christianity was, by right. the way, you know, a form of mental illness, as far as I can see. And so I think. This is why I, earlier in our conversation I hinted at Lewis's own personal awareness of his inadequacies. Because Lewis was not someone who browbeat people into faith. He was someone who had these conversations and, and felt these ideas. Right. I think one of the things that I often feel is on reading Lewis that he found apologetics to be very, very difficult and actually quite almost like threatening to faith, not because he couldn't give good answers, but because it drained him spiritually. And also this constant um, feeling, I have failed. And I think that, that, from my view, that really means we have to take a theological view of apologetics, not simply as arguing for, the, for faith, but recognizing that in some way God's involved in this, using yes. us. Right. And that very often we plant seeds that may grow later, right. which we don't see. But very often we just don't know, and therefore you don't give up and just keep going. Right. Because the job needs to be done, and you may not be worth it every time, but you still do it because it needs to be done. And if you're planting God's seed, it will grow in due course. That's a, you know, I, I take great consolation when I reflect on Lewis and the fact that he felt like he was a failure in certain respects. But I, as a person living, you know, years later, look back at him as a tremendous success. <laughs> anyway, any thoughts you guys want to uh, add to things, uh, questions before we wrap up? I think we're already over time. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. Anything, Tom? Well, this has been uh, truly an honor, and, and we've yeah, learned yeah. we learned much. And for anyone who isn't familiar with Professor uh, McGrath's works, there are plenty out there for the taking. Right. And so please look them up, and I'm sure he'd be happy to share some of his favorites uh, with you as well. Well, we'll when we uh, pr produce this episode of the podcast, we'll put a link to in the show notes to your published works so that people can get a hold of them. Is there any way that you may want people to know anything you want them to know about maybe that they wouldn't know just by going on Amazon? or? One of my most recent books is simply called Christian Apologetics and Introduction. And it really is an entry-level intro to Christian apologetics. I talk about Lewis, I talk about Tim Keller, but basically it's really just saying, look, you can do this. And maybe that might be a good starting place for someone. Okay, that's great. That's a great place to end. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the conversation. Yeah, it's been a joy to have you. All right, great. <laughs> The Theology Podcast is a ministry of Trinity Reformed Church in Huntsville, Alabama. To learn more about the church, you can visit trinityreformedkirk.com, trinityreformedkirk.com.